Hello, and welcome to the lecture on chapter 11. This one is going to be significantly shorter than uh, the one from chapter 10 on the heart, but I'm still going to do it in four parts um, as a way of just breaking up the material a little bit for you. So the respiratory system, um, I'm going to try to super simplify things in the beginning, and then we'll get into some more detail as we go along. Uh, so what it's about is uh, two gases, uh, oxygen and carbon dioxide. The oxygen, I'm going to remind you what we need the oxygen for. Oh, there's no significance to whether the two is a subscript or not. It's just whether I had a moment to do the subscript. So I'm not trying to make any kind of distinction if it's a regular two or a subscripted two. So pretend that this is a subscripted two. Um, so what oxygen is needed for is in cellular respiration. It is the final electron acceptor of the electron transport chain in the mitochondria. So what that means is that it's needed for ATP production. And not having enough oxygen means not enough ATP production and can mean the death of the cells. Regarding carbon dioxide, it is also related to cellular respiration. Where this carbon comes from is the breakdown of carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. These are the, the food, the fuel molecules that we get from food. And I know it sounds insane, but when you breathe out and you're releasing carbon dioxide, that carbon, where it came from, was the Cheerios that you had for breakfast or whatever fuel you're using. Oh my gosh, amazing. So yeah, that's where the car all that carbon is coming from, is all those um, organic compounds that we eat. Why it matters. So yeah, carbon dioxide, it's a, it's a waste from cellular respiration, but the impact that it has on our blood is that it affects, dang it, it affects the acidity of the blood. It affects the pH. And, and I'll try to show you shortly um, in what way it can affect the, the pH. Um, but it's, a, it's an, a very important component to our maintaining homeostasis with this, you know, blood uh, pH between 7.35 and 7.45 um, is largely due to the amount of carbon dioxide that's, that's dissolved in the blood. All right, super, super simplified, three aspects of respiration. There's ventilation that's represented here. Uh, in green, this is bringing air in and out of an alveolus. Perfusion, that's represented here in blue, that is delivering blood from the heart. Remember the blood from the heart, it's gonna be right back. That's from the right side of the heart. And then why we need to move air in and why we need to move blood through is so that this last thing can happen, gas exchange. It's allowing these air molecules to diffuse, these gas molecules. We're moving oxygen, of course, from the air into the blood and we're moving carbon dioxide from the blood into the air. Pretty simple. When we say that somebody has a respiratory disease, that means one or more of these aspects is going to be impacted, either ventilation, perfusion, or gas exchange, or some combination of them. For the rest of the lecture, I'll on the, in the title part of the slide, I've indicated whether it's related to ventilation, gas exchange, or perfusion. So let's take a look at ventilation, gas exchange. The lungs and the chest wall and a very strong muscle at the bottom called the diaphragm, they have to work together as a unit. They have to be intact. Um, that allows us to draw air in by actively creating a partial vacuum. That's what, what the diaphragm contracting does. It lowers, um, which increases the space that we have in the, in the chest cavity. But if you don't have any holes anywhere else, the only hole the air can get in is either through the mouth or in the nose. And that's how that vacuum gets filled with air. Then um, usually expiration is passive. We just relax the diaphragm. That increases the pressure in here and stuff gets pushed out. Um, but it's, it's passive. I say pushed out, but it's passive. The way a 
a balloon emptying. So we, we had talked about this last week, you blow up a balloon and then you let it go and <clears throat> there's recoil. There's no muscle in a balloon. It's just recoil. And largely that elastic recoil is what we're counting on for the exhalation. Inspiration, breathing in, depends on what's referred to as compliance. It's not an especially informative term. What it means is expandability. Um, as you will see, some respiratory diseases um, have a problem with too much compliance. The, the, the uh, structures stretch too much, too fast. Um, and um, in other cases, we have the opposite problem, not enough compliance. I'm gonna pause for just a minute. Hopefully that was just a very brief stop for you. Uh, let's see, compliance. So uh, either stretch too much or in some cases there's restriction and, and the, the, the structures don't stretch enough. Um, then the alveoli, this is the interface. This is where that gas exchange can happen. It's the interface between the lung air and the pulmonary capillary blood. Uh, and those gases are, are um, diffuse, they're just diffusing. It's this passive process. They just move down their concentration gradients. Uh, you don't have to pay for that. A brief review of the anatomy, what we call the upper respiratory tract and where you refer to having an upper respiratory infection. We're talking about nasal cavity, pharynx. Um, it's very, uh, very prone to infection and allergic reactions because that's where we you know, first breathe stuff in. And then lower respiratory tract, sometimes infectious agents can drip down and get into the lungs. And that's when it advances to a lower respiratory tract infection, starting at the larynx. Um, we can also have allergic reactions um, and gas exchange happens right way down here at the in, in the alveoli. I say down here, there's also alveoli up here, but uh, deep into the lungs. A, a little bit more terminology. Uh, conducting zone versus respiratory zone. The only difference is, do you have any alveoli? Wherever there's al alveoli, that's part of the respiratory zone. Um, anywhere you don't have alveoli, that's just conducting. That means air is moving through, but we're not going to be able to do any of this gas exchange. Um, now, it doesn't mean we can skip that part. We still, you still need to get the air in. All right, here's a lot of detail that I need you to understand. Um, so let's see, I'm gonna cover three things, the pleura, the pleural space, and the muscles that are involved. So let's talk about the pleura first. I'm gonna remind you the pleura is epithelial tissue. And um, this is comparable to what we saw on the heart. There's a, a pericardial, membrane, there's visceral and there's parietal um, on the wall. And basically what they're for is making a little bit of fluid so that as the heart pumps, it, there's not a huge amount of friction. Same thing goes for the lungs. When we breathe in and breathe out, stuff's moving and we don't need that to be, you know, ripping against, the tissues don't have to be ripping against each other. And so um, we have this, this, you know, single cell layer thick, um, I don't know if I said that right, single cell thick layer um, uh, of epithelial tissue that uh, some of the cells secrete a, a little bit of fluid. The part that's on the organ itself um, is known as the visceral pleura. That's the part that's actually touching the lung. And then the parietal pleura, um, again, for those of you who speak Spanish, this is from the Latin for wall, pared. It's, so parietal means it's on the wall of, of the chest. I'm gonna give you a way to think about this. Um, so if you can think about your underwear, like the visceral pleura, so you're the lung, your body is the lung. Uh, the, the underwear is the visceral pleura, and then your pants are the parietal pleura. And there's a little bit of space. Of course, I'm putting my hands in my pants. Um, so um, like the, there's a little bit of space in there. It's sometimes referred to as a potential space, meaning that 
stuff can get in there. Mostly we want nothing to be in there except the tiny little bit of fluid. Uh, so this pleural space, this, uh, sometimes you'll see it called the pleural cavity, which is misleading because it makes it sound like this big cavernous area. It's just that potential space. Again, always think, you know, space between my underwear and my pants. Um, that thin layer of fluid there decreases friction. We say there's negative pressure there, which confuses everybody. But think about it this way. There's atmospheric pressure, you know, to all around us is the pressure of the air pushing down on us. Um, and the pressure that's inside that space is at less than atmospheric pressure. That pushes the lung tissue up against the wall. And that is desirable, that's what you want. Uh, so it keeps the lungs in close contact with the chest wall and with the diaphragm. And you can see the diagram here, parietal pleura, that's your pants, visceral pleura, that's your underwear, the lung, that's you, and then the space between the pants and the underwear is there. All right, uh, let's talk a little bit about um, the muscles that move things around. Inhalation is active. That is bringing uh, air into the lungs. That's an active process. We actually have to expend energy to do that. And the way we do it is by contracting this muscle called the diaphragm. That's that dome shaped muscle down here. When it contracts, it flattens out. And so it increases the space in the chest. There are also intercostal muscles. Um, they lift the ribs, pull, pull the, the ribs up. If somebody's really straining to breathe, you'll sometimes see the sternocleidomastoid also gets engaged and you know, there, there's more um, accessory muscles that help with inspiration. But with quiet breathing, it's just diaphragm and external intercostals. Then with exhalation, having the air come out, usually it's passive. Um, if we have to blow, if we have to push air out, it, this involves using the abdominal musculature. Think about, about blowing out birthday candles. <sighs> you know, you, you actually contract abdominal musculature, but again, with quiet breathing, it's, it's, it's a passive process. It does not require energy. And as we'll see, this is one of the reasons that some of these uh, respiratory diseases are so exhausting um, because what is for a, a typical patient or a typical person, um, a passive process actually requires effort all the time on, on the part of the patient. All right, ventilation, uh, neural control. Um, whenever we talk about the nervous system, there's kind of two aspects to it. You've got to think about sensory input, getting messages from the body in towards the brain, and then motor output from the brain out to the rest of the body. So the sensory in input comes, uh, probably the most important part is the chemoreception. That's detecting the blood gases. Um, and what we call central chemoreception is within the brain. Our, um, our understanding of where these uh, chemoreceptors are exactly in the brain is changing. We used to think it was just in the medulla, but now there seem to be other areas that are also involved, but let's just leave it with central chemoreception is in the brain and peripheral chemoreception is anywhere outside of the brain. And I'll tell you um, where they are in the aorta and in the carotids. And I, I think of those as near the center of the body, but it, it's peripheral in the sense of it's not in the head. Okay, and then there's some other um, okay, we've got the chemoreceptors up here, put, putting information in towards the medulla. Um, other peripheral receptors would be like stretch receptors, um, airway irritant receptors. That's gonna have some input as well. Then when we're sending um, information out, there are a few really important nerves to know. Um, probably the most important one to understand is the diaphragm. That's the, the major muscle of breathing. It's innervated by the phrenic nerve. This one, it comes off very high in the neck. Um, so it's part of the, it comes off as part of the cervical plexus. Um, why I'm mentioning this is because um, you would think, because you know paralysis happens it, it, wherever there's a spinal cord injury, uh, typically areas below the level of the spinal cord injury are impacted. 
And yet we have people who have uh, cervical spinal cord injuries and yet they can still breathe on their own. Um, and the reason for this is because that phrenic nerve comes off so high up, up here in the neck um, that uh, the patients are spared um, having to be on a respirator for the rest of their lives. However, if the, the, the uh, accident happens high enough in the neck, then it will impact the phrenic nerve as well. And then that patient has to be um, assisted with breathing for the rest of their lives. Um, all right, so that's the phrenic nerve. Then the intercostals, those would be more impacted by a spinal cord injury because they're coming off a little bit lower down in the spinal nerves. Those innervate the intercostals. And then the smooth muscle inside the lungs um, innervated by parasympathetic division along the vagus nerve. The vagus, I'll remind you, vagus is that uh, cranial nerve that leaves the, the head, it leaves the brain, but then it goes wandering all over the body All right, that's everything here. Um, some the tissues that are involved, we've got epithelium lining all the airways. Uh, we have smooth muscle. Uh, that's the source of the bronchoconstriction is that smooth muscle can respond uh, to certain stimuli. And elastic fibers, we'll talk about these more um, in a moment, um, but these basically, they're, they get stretched when we inspire when we breathe in. And then when we relax the diaphragm, these elastic fibers recoil, they come back um, to their normal shape. And that's what pushes a lot of the air out. How we protect uh, our airway. Uh, as you know, we're getting a lot of traffic in and out. Um, so we have goblet cells that make mucus. Um, the mucus is over the epithelial surface. And um, we have ciliated epithelial cells. They're the ones with the little finger-like projections that kind of push the, the mucus out um, and allow us to cough stuff out of our lungs. That mucus being fluid enough to, to move uh, depends on the secretion of some ions. And you learned about this already in this class, um, or you probably knew it from before, um, but it's the secretion of the chloride ions. Um, that's gonna draw sodium out. It's gonna draw um, the water out and to the epithelial surface, which waters down that mucus so that we can cough it out. So the mechanism of the chloride transport, transport is, uh, a transport protein. It's the, the transport protein is named after the disease that's caused by malfunctioning of this thing, but it's named that even in healthy people. So it's the cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator, the CFTR. And so even if we don't have cystic fibrosis, that's what we call this transporter. And now let's talk a little bit about cystic fibrosis. Um, as you know, this gene, the CFTR gene, it, so CFTR, it's a protein. So it's coded for by a gene and like any gene, it can have mistakes in it. Um, if someone is homozygous um, for a CFTR gene mutation, they're not gonna be able to make this protein right. And so they try to make it, but it stays inside the cell. It never gets put into the cell membrane. And so we don't get the movement of the chloride ions. We don't get the movement of the sodium out and the water out the way it's supposed to. And we end up with this very thick mucus. Um, eventually it forms plugs. This also impairs, you may remember, um, transport of bicarbonate ions. So, so this mucus um, becomes really acidic and that impairs the ability of the white blood cells to do their job. So we end up with infections um, and uh, all kinds of consequences. Um, uh, I'll remind you, although this is a, a huge problem in the respiratory system, these mucus plugs also impact um, pancreatic function, um, uh, impacts the reproductive system. Anywhere you're, you have a, a, an epithelial surface with mucus on it is gonna be impacted by this. <clears throat> 
uh, very briefly, uh, pulmonary function tests, um, PFT. I'm not gonna go into a huge amount of detail about this, um, except for one test a little bit later in the lecture. Um, in case anybody wants to spend any time on this, volumes do not overlap. So tidal volumes, just the normal breathing in and out, um, the inspiratory reserve volume, et cetera. These are just in, like, if you talk about a volume, you're talking about just that thing. If you talk about um, capacities, those include multiple volumes together. Why this matters is different lung diseases will cause different results on these pulmonary function tests. And so it's one way of diagnosing different lung diseases. All right, let's talk a little bit about uh, respiratory system pressures um, and why it matters. So we have said before that we have a parietal layer of uh, the pleura and we have a visceral layer of the pleura and we want them to be near each other, touching each other. Uh, So-called negative pressure having less than atmospheric pressure so that the lung kind of gets pushed up against the wall. It is undesirable to lose contact. And yet it happens, and it happens for a bunch of different reasons. And it, <laughs> we have a different name for it, depending on what it is that's getting in between the parietal layer and the visceral layer, between the pants and the underwear. If it's air, we call it a pneumothorax. Uh, this allows the pressures to equilibrate. So you no longer have this so-called negative pressure here. All of a sudden air is coming in and this whole lung can collapse. Whoops, wrong way. This whole lung can collapse. Um, obviously that's a problem because we can't get air to move in and out of it. But the other thing that it does is it moves the uh, mediastinum or mediastinum off to the side. And so the heart is being pushed off to the side. That's no good. So yeah, we wanna resolve these things. Um, if it's fluid that's getting in there, we call it a pleural effusion. If it's blood, it's a hemothorax. If we have pus, empyema, um, we, we need to get the stuff out um, because even, a little, even the fluid can lead to uh, a collapsed lung. Let's see, how you get it out? Uh, thoracentesis, chest tube, pull the stuff out so that you can reestablish that negative pressure and have the lung reinflate. And this will be the final slide for part one. Um, there is a substance called surfactant that we need to talk about. You know, lungs, they're wet. So there's fluid that lines the alveoli. That allows, so this is a, a big close up of an alveolus, and there's fluid lining it here. That helps uh, gas exchange because oxygen can dissolve in that fluid and pass into the blood. But um, you know, water has a high uh, surface tension. Um, maybe you don't know it as that, but. Um, if you've ever gone swimming in clothes or your clothes have gotten soaking wet and your like your clothes are stuck up against you, you know that that's because of the surface tension of the water. Um, and so it would be hard to get dressed or undressed when your clothes are soaking wet. So if we just had water, if we just had uh, the you know, water-based fluids in there, um, these things would flatten out and be hard to pop open every time. So there's a stuff called surfactant. It is a combination of phospholipid and protein. Um, and phospholipids, lipid part is gonna be hydrophobic, uh, move away from the water. And the phospho part is gonna be hydrophilic um, so this stuff kind of spreads out and you can see it on um, this blow up section. Um, the lipid tails are gonna move away from the water, but basically it keeps things from collapsing on, on themselves. Um, and they're made by, uh, the surfactant is made by specific cell type two alveolar epithelial cells. Um, and 
it makes um, alveolar inflation easier because the two sides don't come flat up against each other. And so it reduces this problem of having the alveoli collapse every time. Sometimes surfactant has to be added in to people. For example, uh, preterm babies often have to have this added. And adults with acute respiratory distress syndrome, um, ARDS will interfere with the ability of the type two um, alveolar epithelial cells to make the surfactant. And so the alveoli all collapse. And so adding surfactant helps a little bit with trying to keep those open. And that is the end of part one.